Mark Bright. I'm the Vice President of Programs at the James Beard Foundation. I oversee our industry support work as well as policy advocacy, women's leadership, uh, sustainability, education, and policy advocacy, I think. A few things at the foundation. <laughs> um, so this is the, a release event for our very first industry report. We've been doing surveys every fall of the industry for the last, this is a third year, um, but in the past have been quite brief and this year we decided to be more substantial. Um, and this coincided with Bento Box doing their restaurant trend report. Um, and we're just so excited to be collaborating on this event today with you all at Bento Box and you'll hear from the Bento Box report um, right after I give you the highlights of the James Beard one. It's always great when we work with partners who are aligned with us and who are also have as their first goal to make this industry better and to provide resources for the industry. So um, hopefully you will find both of these resources uh, that we are presenting today useful to you. So we have been, um, as I mentioned, we've been surveying the industry with short questions every fall, but this year we are doing this more in depth. We ran a survey in late October and uh, through mid-November asking the industry to reflect on high and lows of 2023 and also to think about opportunities and challenges of 2024, um, what they were most looking forward to and what they were not so looking forward to. So the good news um, is that the industry is the most stable it's been since 2019, based on um, the survey. Um, diners are more educated and engaged. They understand better the challenges of the industry. And the industry is making more progress towards more sustainable and equitable conditions for staff. The challenge is, um, I'm sure that's no surprise to you all in the industry who are here with us today, the rising costs that impact both operations and how often people go out to dinner. Um, in our 2022 fall survey, um, which focused a lot on uh, ch supply chain and labor strains, that was already the case. Rising costs were the main concern, but there wasn't as much of a concern then about consumers' habits, and this year that was one of the big differences. The fact that there's a lot of concern around people are going out to dinner less. Um, so this is the case for optimism. 67% of, of respondents said that 2023 was a good or average year and 51% are tracking better or the same in terms of number as they did in 2019. So the question asked 2019 to see where we were pre-pandemic and then some also um, how they were doing based on last year's numbers. So about the same number of people have fewer customers this fall than they did in 2022. Um, and there was also a sense of optimism with respondents saying they were seeing more guests coming out, especially during events and community gathering. But a majority of uh, respondents reported having lower profit. <laughs> So while um, check averages were higher for 47% of respondents, that doesn't mean that chefs are making more money, to the contrary. These higher check averages come because of increased menu prices, and I'll return to that. Um, but profits are lower compared to 2022. And 2022 was already not a great year when it comes to profits. Uh, top concerns going into 2024 compared to last fall's top concern rising. And so we asked uh, respondents to, uh, to rank their answers. So these are the ones that came up uh, first in that order, rising food costs, rising labor costs, can't find staff to hire. Um, the good news here, there are more people looking for work. In 2022, it was 27% of people who ranked uh, staff, uh, not being able to find staff highest. Now we're down to 13%. In the written in answers, a lot of people were commenting on the fact that, unfortunately, as other industries are suffering layoffs, more people are coming back to work in restaurants. So that's the silver lining for our industry, basically, that there are more people looking for work again uh, with us. The, um, we had also heard in a lot of conversations throughout the country about business being down because of rising crime or because of strikes in industries such as automotive or uh, in LA in particular, all of the movies, uh, movie industry related strikes. Um, that did not come up in the results here. Climate change, rising crime strikes, and global even figure lower on the list. And this is really because of their episodic nature and variable geographic impact. However, in the question of what are some of the 
what do you consider the biggest challenges of 2024? Those appeared very frequently. War, crime, um, uh, inflation, things that affect tourism in particular for people located in uh, areas who depend more on tourism and might have more seasonal businesses. Um, those externalities were really big concerns for next year, uh, due in part to all of the uncertainty. Increased food and labor costs significantly imp impacted menu content and pricing. Um, continued rising food and labor costs affected menu content and pricing for most of the uh, owners, independent restaurant owners surveyed, which continued on the trend we had already seen in 2022 of higher prices, smaller menus. 76% of respondents resp reported menu prices that are on average 10 to 25% higher than in 2022. And then we asked if people had increased their um, prices in the last six months. So 88% responded including increased prices, including 61 on the entire menu. Um, and then the, the 12, of the 12% who did not raise their prices, 16% said they would raise their prices in six months, in three months, sorry, from those answers. And the reasons why people said they were not going to increase, they were they had not increased their prices included being afraid of losing customers. That was the number one answer there, um, or because they rely on volume of diners to make their numbers work. That was the second highest answer. One respondent wrote in that they did not raise prices because everyone is having a hard time. I don't want to push that on my clients. And then others' uh, reasons for not increasing prices were circumstantial, such as one person who said, we opened one year ago and haven't needed to raise prices, while another wrote in saying, we changed from a hospitality-included model to a tipped model and dropped our prices due to that. So other strategies um, to uh, impact the pricing overall. And then what we've seen also is menus are getting smaller. So 56% of respondents have reduced the number of dishes on their menus and simplified their offerings as a result of rising food costs. Um, and then more than one third reduced the number of dishes but kept the level of food the same. So um, overall, a lot of changes happening on menus because of these rising costs. The, su the supply chain has stabilized, however, um, and we saw here that there was not a lot of changes between 22 and 23 in terms of uh, shopping habits. Most of the respondents buy from a mix of local and national uh, purveyors, um, and then the, the slight rise in uh, the number of respondents who buy mostly from local sources. Um, the wages obviously had a huge impact, the rise in wages, the rise in labor cost. Um, restaurants owners need to attract or retain employees remained a dominant trend of 23, impacting decision around raising wages, but not necessarily affecting opening hours. That was one thing we asked also, uh, if people had cut down on their hours and the number of days they were open, the number of shifts, not really, and certainly not as much as they did in 2022. So besides fighting over labor in a small labor pool, even though that is changing a little bit, um, the majority of respondents raised their wages between 10 and 25 percent. Um, that's slightly down from 57 percent who had raised their wages um, that much in 2022. Um, and then 22 percent increased their wages by 10 percent or less. So again, the only numbers that were lower, that was lower this year, is the increase of wages between 25 and 50 percent, which is only 10 percent of respondents, and 14 percent had had to raise it that much. Uh, so there's probably some stability here. Probably in 22, a lot of people staffed back up also um, in a way that is now um, more normalized. But so very high wages. And then this is the case for optimism for 2024. That's how we want to think of our industry as feeling optimistic. And that's what was reflected um, 
with a slight majority in the surveys. So um, many chefs are going into 2024 with a renewed sense of optimism and pride. Um, and the top reasons are uh, for, the, for this, in the, these were all open-ended responses. And Ali on uh, my team here combed through all of them, thank you. <laughs> um, include more distance from the pandemic shutdown. That was one big thing people felt like, okay, finally we're getting back to some sense of normal. An increase in consumer education, as I mentioned, a drive to create better working conditions and benefits for industry employees and advocacy efforts. And then on the flip side of that, the uh, industry challenges is what really tempered the enthusiasm, the, uh, the, the increasing food and labor costs and economic inflation. Um, that can create greater customer frustration with menu prices, of course, and adversely impact spending habits and dining out frequency, which has repercussions for restaurants, profits, and employee wages, of course. Um, and then there were definitely a number of respondents who answered nothing on the question question of what makes you optimistic for 2024. Um, that was already the case in 2022 when asking about 2023. Nothing was also an answer. Not the most frequent answer, at least, but definitely an answer that a number of people said. Um, with more diners understanding restaurants' cost of doing business and valuing the impact restaurants and its workers have in their community, there is hope that diners will continue to frequent establishments even if, as prices increase, particularly for those restaurants that are making a concerted effort towards improving staff welfare. One chef shared that persevering through 2023's challenges has reinforced their commitment to their restaurant and staff for the year ahead. There's always a need for people in the food industry to contribute to culture, history, and community. That person wrote in. Uh, we also had a lot of answers in terms of people always need to eat. So there's always something very reassuring there. It's, you're gonna be feeding people at some point. Um, and then in terms of the, the um, so some specificities around the, 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 the categories. So um, up, making more distance from the pandemic shutdown, one person answered, operating is slowly getting back to a pre-pandemic vibe and I'm enthused to focus on training and quality for 2024. I think 2024, we will have a second winter behind us post-pandemic. This will provide a more accurate consumer behavior pattern to forecast. And, and that's definitely been a big challenge, the impossibility to forecast anything, right? I'm sure you can all relate to, to that. We've, for our Women's Entrepreneurial Leadership Program, we ask for revenues for the last three years as part of the application process. And 20, the 2023 revenue is the first one that is starting to go back to normal. Unfortunately, partly because of no government help anymore that was prevalent in previous years and we could see that reflected a lot. Uh, but there is definitely this sense now that, all right, we can start, we've had a pretty normal year, we can start modeling what this might be like for next year. And that's so important, especially with rising costs. The more you can and make these productivities the better. And then the, um, in terms of consumer education, um, restaurant re operators are optimistic that diners will continue to deepen their education and recognize the part they play in creating a more sustainable industry for restaurant workers. One respondent expressed their hope for the year ahead, writing in that more educated clientele will adapt to new and better changes to the dining experience. If the dining public has a foundational understanding of the investment required to execute a meal service in a landscape with ever rising costs, the hope is that they are more likely to continue supporting independent restaurants, understanding the importance that they serve for their communities and neighborhood, um, and supporting the owners there who are creating a sustainable and equitable workplace. Some of the answers were definitely saying that there's either the diners were extremely educated and extremely supportive of restaurants missions and completely on board or the complete opposite. And it seems like there's not that much in the middle. Um, and that was also true in terms of the viability of a lot of uh, restaurant concepts. A lot of people were saying fine dining and fast casual are okay. The middle is where the challenges are because there's a lot of lot less flexibility in terms of pricing. Um, there's a lot, lot less elasticity there. 
Um, and then other chefs who were uh, responding, talking about people being excited to be going out um, and seem to understand why um, the prices have increased and understand that it's not because chefs are lining their pockets. Restaurants are a core part of consumer culture and chefs are hopeful that diners will continue to support independent restaurants and value the people who make their dining experience possible. I see a lot of positive change around customers willing to pay more for dining out. There has been more press and education around the expense of processes involved in what it takes to get food on a plate. And then the renewed intention to focus on employee wages and welfare. So there's been a lot of changes there and a lot of the respondents were talking about the, the very positive changes of the values of the industry overall, shifting towards care and inclusivity. Um, and that taking care of your employees is the, uh, the expectation instead of the exception. So a lot of very positive moves there, um, which of course for a lot of people has come for lack of choice. If you've seen the results. If you want to hire people, you need to make that. If you want to have staff, you need to give them the type of work environments where benefits is part of the package, a living wage or as close to that as possible is part of the package. So there's a realization from owners and management that the workers are and should be the top priority. I'm optimistic that continued wage increases will lead to more benefits for workers. Uh, a lot of people talk about mental health, employee welfare, all of that in their responses. And then another, um, another reason to be optimistic was partly buoyed by advocacy work. So a lot of people um, mentioned that they felt there was, they were, was around a lot of concerns around politics, especially going into a, an election year, and those were some of the concerns going into 2024. But the fact that organizations like JBF as several, I mean, we're polling them, so obviously they're going to mention the work that we're doing, but that's okay, it means they know what we're doing. Um, same thing with Bento, it's a, you're polling your people, so they should know what, you're, um, what are some of the things that you're doing. So there are a lot of, um, Optimism came from, a, from this feeling that you can make a difference through advocacy, which was really great. It's this, kind, this empowerment of like, all right, there are challenges, but there's something we can do about it, especially going into an election year was really great. Um, and then, so one of the respondents there said, change makers in the hospitality space that are fiercely advocating and promoting the needed changes in our industry. So the fact that this was not a one-off, change is not a one-off there. And then the biggest challenges uh, are very similar to um, what were the challenges of 2023, rising labor, food and labor costs, staffing, inflation, and competition. Um, balancing food labor costs against consumer expectation would be their biggest challenge next year for one of the respondents. Another echoed that sentiment that included educating consumer, customers on why and how pricing works, and the economy rising costs and people not willing to pay for them. So this is where there's a lot of uncertainty, obviously. Inflation is not something that any of us controls. We don't control what else is going up and affects people's spending um, capabilities. And then the competition piece is interesting because some people were saying, put it as a good thing, a lot of restaurants had closed since the pandemic started. So that meant fewer competitors and more business for them. And then others were saying actually more and more restaurants are opening again, or we are fighting for a smaller pool of customers um, and less consumer spending money um, in, our, um, in our market. So a competition was both a good and a, uh, a challenge for a lot of the people responding. And then one respondent talked about uh, being able to pay for rising healthcare premiums for our coworkers and the rising cost of benefits, um, especially tied to legislation. We found that in some of the, re the majority of respondents were New York and California. So two states that have pretty good, especially California, worker legislation and policies in place, which does mean increased costs for, um, for business operators. So there was a sense of concern there for sure in terms of the challenges of, of the uh, increase in all of these costs for them. 
Um, and then this is where you can find the survey um, at jamesyard.org slash industry support. Uh, we, this will be along with all of our webinars and um, a lot of in-person programming we record as well into our virtual education library. Because for us, it's not just about surveying you all and finding out what the issues are, but what can we do about it as JBF and how can we support uh, the industry? What are the sort of programs and training, you know, including the advocacy piece? Obviously, we have a ambitious plan for 2024 around that. Um, we do a financial literacy workshop training, which hopefully, um, you know, for, um, well, can help address some of the ways to be nimble around inflation, rising costs, etc. And so that's it from the James Beard side of things. I will now pass the mic to the Bento Box team, represented by <laughs> Andrew, Andy, no, Lenny, you're starting us, right? Yes. Okay, can... perfect. Lenny DeFranco, the Bento Box Senior Brand Manager, and do you want me to introduce? Sure, go ahead. Crystal yeah. Mybaney, the uh, Bento Box co-founder and Fister of Ed, Head of Restaurant Solution, right over there. And next to her is Andy Berman, Director of Business Strategy at Fister of Restaurant Solutions, and Colby Kingston, Bento Box Social Media Marketing Manager. Let's give them a round of applause. Cool. So, yes. Um, uh, it's a pleasure to be up here representing the team that put together the Bento Box annual report. Um, as a little bit of introduction, Bento Box is a marketing and commerce platform serving restaurants. And this is the seventh annual uh, end of year industry look back that we've done, the second one that I've been a part of. And um, basically the concept is that we you know, work with thousands of restaurants across the country and also have, you know, many conversations with these people throughout the year. And so by combining actual transaction data, website data that is accessible within our product with some of the insights from our team, um, we have, uh, we're able to produce a report that identifies like specific trends that define the industry. And so uh, you can access it yourself if you go to 2023restaurants.com and it redirects to our site. And I'm gonna overview a few of them now, and our panelists will talk about the other ones. So to, to kick it off, um, I think this is something that was represented really well in the James Beard report that we just saw. Um, it's very tentative, but at a, t at a top line level, restaurant spending is up. The restaurant industry grew. Um, Andy's gonna dig in a little bit more into the d dynamics of it, but uh, restaurant spending across the country was up 7% over 2022. And uh, restaurant openings also were up. Every region in the country but one uh, had experienced more restaurant openings in 2023 than the last year. Um, but that might belie some other difficulties. Um, we've, I'm sure, all seen a lot of tipping discourse this year. There's been countless like CNBC article type coverage of this, you know, like are people sick of tipping? And um, this year we were able to, I think, meaningfully contribute to the, that discourse with a report that we published as part of National Restaurant Workers Day at the end of October, which James Beard also helped us uh, observe. And in that it basically, the report, which is also accessible through the trend report, um, we were able to take, I think the, the first diner specific, hospitality specific uh, survey of, of diner sentiment on, on tipping. And what it actually revealed was that there's this tension in tipping where it's broadly unpopular, but diners do appreciate the control that it, it gives them. And so I think there's implications there for if we were to actually want to do away with it, what can we offer diners in return to actually do something different. And then reservations, this is an interesting one. This is the first year that we launched our reservations module um, at Bento Box. And some of the data that came in from that has been pretty interesting. You see here, it drove one third of all covers. Um, I think something that surprised me about this was that, was how spontaneous it was too. 71% um, of all reservations were made on mobile and the average lead time for reservations was 18 hours. Um, 
So I'll pause there, and I want to uh, bring in Crystal, the co-founder and CEO of BentoBox. So, okay, um, you have countless conversations with restaurants <laughs> throughout the year. What is your impression of how they felt this year went? Yeah, I would. I mean, I would echo a lot of what we've heard. I think that it's been. Um, one of the first years that restaurants started being fully out of survival mode, we had like pandemic and it was really just like, how do I actually continue to serve my community? How do I continue to serve diners? Um, and now it was like, this year I think was the first full one, I think I read in your report that there weren't any restrictions at all. So I think restaurants really, to go back to that first point, moved into a growth mindset. You know, the sp supply chain normalized, not perfect. Um, events started coming back. And so restaurants were now starting to be like, well, how can I serve my diners and um, how can I grow? And I think that also really speaks to what, what, what Ann just spoke about is that they started really focusing on diner spending a lot, you know, what's like driving that. Um, and, uh, but I do think that there was a general sentiment of progress. How can I do more? And I also a lot of optimism as you, as you pointed out. So, cool. Yeah. And then, so I'm going to go into this next point. Yeah. So, um, one of the big, well, let me ask you what, <laughs> yeah. in terms of the challenges that you yeah, feel yeah, yeah. you saw, what were some yeah. of the big ones? Um, and we, we put together, a. Uh, in addition to our data, um, and many and I talked about this a bunch before before today. In addition to our data, you know, we have established um, a hospitality council with um, a bunch of really great restaurateurs that we're talking to. I mean, I'm sending them emails like constantly, like, how's what's going on in your world on this topic and this topic. Um, and some of the people on the hospitality council were also um, with me to on this dinner that we got invited to at um, Kathy Hochul's house, the governor of New York. And just through all these like experiences, the big thing I kept hearing was this labor, this this labor issue that we've talked about. Um, and it wasn't so much about the increasing like wages, but the increasing cost was just um, again around the benefits, paid vacation. Um, uh, health care, mental health, uh, and these are just restaurant owners really want to treat their staff well. And I think that a shift that's happening, and it's a good one, is that restaurant workers are becoming much less like transient. Like this is a career, you know, this is a place to establish yourself, to put roots, and you can um, really have like a fulfilling long-term career in this industry. And restaurant owners want to be able to support that, but it's hard because the profits are just um, they're thin. And so I was hearing a lot about how um, one owner in particular was really looking towards for, wanted to offer mental health benefits. There was crazy stuff happening in the world um, and was having a hard time being able to do that and was really looking to, um, you know, local government officials, state-run programs, universities, like who are doing stuff with their residents, um, and trying to get creative as to how they can offer these types of benefits when they really actually can't afford it, but they know how important it is. Yeah, so I think this is a really interesting data point to events what Crystal was just mentioning. Um, in September, it was the first month in three and a half years that the industry, the hospitality industry regained uh, employment that it had pre-pandemic. It was, I, I think it was the slowest recovery sector that the Bureau of Labor Statistics recognizes. And um, the thing that transpired in that time was this process of struggling to find people, but also I think making all of these adjustments that Chris was just talking about. How do we actually bring people back and what do we have to do? And this was fascinating to me when I found it. Like the, what we can do is search for certain keywords across bento box sites. And so the job postings that restaurants have put up this year compared to last year have these increases in these terms. So there's double the mentions of healthcare on restaurant job postings this year as last year. Paid time off is uh, nearly quadrupled. Paid vacation, mental health. There is a cost to this, but this is also a, this is not altruism. This is a response to that employment, sector employment curve very, very gradually getting up and the work that it's taken to get there. Um, and then let me go to the next. This is a little bit more maybe optimistic or an opportunity for restaurants. 
Um, so 15% more e-commerce revenue this year than last. And you see that these categories have broad increases. Um, and so I want to throw it again to Crystal. So what do you, how do you interpret the, yeah. the growth in like non-dining room offerings that restaurants are getting into? Yeah, well, I think that, I mean, going back to, I think this is an opportunity for sure. I think restaurants going into that growth mindset are like, how can I deepen the relationship I have with my diners? How can I meet them where they are outside of just the dining room? And so, yeah, the e-commerce revenue, even though the dining room was back in full force, grew 15% year over year. So that's not, that's not nothing. And I think the challenge that I've been hearing from restaurants in navigating all this, um, because they have acknowledged that having a relationship in multiple places with their diner increases the total lifetime value of their diner. But it's like, how many systems do they have to adopt? How many channels do they have to manage? How do they like connect the dots of that diner that is interacting with them in multiple ways? And I think that's, that's just a challenge that as technology providers, I feel like we have a responsibility to really be able to solve because it's unfair. <laughs> and I think it's been solved in other places like travel and retail and, and restaurants are becoming so much more than just the dining room. Um, and restaurant owners want to be responsive and want to be there and, and deepen those relationships. But um, the technology available to them isn't making it easy yet. Yeah, one of the other trends that was in the report is uh, the growth of brand collabs. Like there's a lot of brands that are trying to get in on how cool restaurants are. <laughs> <laughs> they are cool. Okay, so um, this is the um, this is going back to the, the growth um, spending conversation. Um, so for this, I want to bring in Andy, the director of business strategy. So this is a chart showing the growth in uh, spending. Actually, maybe can you talk a little bit about where we got this data? I think that's worth mentioning. Yeah, sure. So our parent company processes a very significant proportion. I don't know the exact 40 number. Forty percent in 40. the U.S. Okay, in there the we US. go. 40% in the US of, of credit card transactions. And so this data comes from that. So it's really a, a very indicative. It's not all 40% because merchants drop in and out, but it's a very representative sample of the industry as a whole. Um, and I don't know if you want me to just jump right Go in ahead, and yeah. talk through it. Um, what, what we're seeing here is, is kind of the end of the pandemic recovery, which is a great thing as we get back to those pre-pandemic sales numbers. If you see kind of in the holiday season, early 2023, there's some really huge growth rates. That's really that end of that recovery. And then the numbers kind of lower out to about 5%. It looks lower on the chart. That's a really solid number. <laughs> it's just that we're back at that full number. We're, we're past some of the really lean years. Um, and so I would call 5% in, in towards the end of 23 a really good year. In terms of some of the dynamics on how we got here, we saw that both growth in average check and transactions went down. It's still growing, just by less. And I'm gonna piggyback on some of Ann's points here. Average check is pretty straightforward. It's all about the pricing. Ann talked about how pricing really shot up last year, taking menu price, and continued to be high this year. The biggest difference we're seeing is the scale or frequency of the increases. So last year, there were much bigger, more frequent increases. This year, they're still happening. They're just a little bit smaller as some of the cost pressures have receded. And then as we talk about transactions, I'm also going to piggyback on another point from Ann. It's all about the economy. Um, so what we're seeing is with inflation hitting co consumers across the wallet, they're starting to slow growth and maybe flatten on the transactions front. Um, but it's uncertain. We're not in a recession, so we're still seeing strong resilience there, just slower growth rates. Yeah, one thing I wanted to add, just to give yeah. context that I see week after week when I see all of the Fiserv data, is the thing you don't see here, because we're just talking about restaurants in our world, but like retail is like down. It's like yeah. down three, four, five percent, you know? So I think this, again, just saying that the five percent for restaurants is, is yeah. strong. Yeah, and five percent settling in here, this is still higher than inflation, so restaurant spending is still growing more than inflation is uh, growing. Um, okay, so given Andy the dynamics you just mentioned, like what do you what do you foresee for next year? So I think there's two major things that's, that are going to impact. One, the economy. Um, some good data has come out recently, which is great. But diner wallets are definitely going to really have a big impact 
on transactions. The point you just made, this wasn't planned, Crystal, but ties really nicely <laughs> into my next point. There's some really, since we're now far enough from the pandemic, there's some really interesting research coming out on consumer behavior post-pandemic. And one of the things that I think is really bullish for the restaurant industry is the shift towards experiences in spending and away from goods. And so I think regardless of how the economy performs, that's gonna pro provide some really nice tailwinds to the industry, especially table service restaurants. Cool, thank you. Um, touch and go, but we're getting there um, as an industry. <laughs> Colby. Uh, yeah. Colby is our social media manager. So, okay, I'll, I'll introduce this by saying um, we have a lot of like internal expertise on the team and in part of the report, it's not just all numbers. We also wanted to bring in some of the aesthetic uh, taste that we have basically. <laughs> and so um, one of the sections was like our web design team because obviously Bento Box specializes in building websites for restaurants. And so we had the web design team write up the trends that they saw this year that defined like what websites are looking like now and what's, what's cool. And Colby is our social media manager and it, it very carefully like monitors and also participates in restaurant social media ecosystem. And so she also wrote up the trends that she saw. So maybe you could talk through the ones that we have here. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think to Crystal's point, this year was a big growth year. And so of course restaurants are turning to different marketing channels um, and social media is a great one because the barrier to entry is so low. Um, these are three examples of trends in social media that I saw this year that I think are really fantastic because uh, they're very easy to adopt um, and they're little shifts that sort of signal um, perhaps where we're headed um, both on social media but also in restaurants. Uh, so the first one here is that food photography uh, got intentionally messy this year. Um, I think that this is a, a move toward more authenticity um, which people are, you know, using to signal um, all kinds of different things. Um, but so rather than seeing like these perfectly manicured dishes across social media for restaurants, uh, one of the things that I noticed is that a lot of restaurants were sort of taking the opportunity to show you maybe the FOMO, what you missed out on. Um, a half eaten a bowl of pasta makes you want it a little bit more perhaps than one that looks like it just came off the line. Um, in the middle here, this is an example of restaurants using um, found photos and found uh, videos different archival pieces that represent the feel and the energy um, of their space. So restaurants, of course, um, are often under-resourced, and so social media can be a really overwhelming and intimidating thing to have to add to your plate. Um, and using these found images to sort of show your potential diners or your diners something about the experience that they're going to have um, is a really low lift way to do that. Um, Super Folly uh, in Philadelphia is a great little wine bar. When I lived in Philly, I loved stopping by, and they have this really iconic staircase. There's not a lot of dining rooms in Philadelphia that are two stories. And so using this um, beautiful painting with the staircase it sort of makes you feel like you're there, even though uh, you know this was something that they just found um, from an artist that they enjoyed. Um, and then finally, entertainment. So we saw a lot more restaurants um, engaging with meme culture um, and finding new ways to entertain. Um, I think we're, you know, we've seen so many images of food at this point. Um, social media has existed for long enough now that um, people are finding new ways to get creative. And um, memes is a great way to do that. So if there, uh, you know, is an opportunity to share that you have an open two top, um, pairing that in some sort of internet uh, entertainment format um, can be a really fun way to do that. Um, and we saw a lot of that this year. Cool. Do you, can I ask, like, do you think there's like a theme that united restaurant social media this year? I think in general, um, as I mentioned with the first one, but across all three of these, you know, really coming across as authentic um, and, and recognizing that what your diner wants is another touch point with you. And so as long as it feels like it embodies, um, you know, the vibe and the energy of your restaurant, um, sometimes uh, physically what gets put up on social media is less important as long as it really comes from that authentic place. Great. So I guess we'll leave it there. Um, again, this for all this and more, there's uh, 2023restaurants.com is where you can access the report. It's got a lot of data. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. We have plenty of time for questions. Um, and we have a mic back there for anyone in the audience. But I have a question for Colby first. Uh, in, what are you, because 
the tricky part with social media is always the fact that we only have so much control over it, right? What are some of the trends you're seeing around algorithms and what's working, what's not there? Um, that's a really good question. I think um, in terms of specifically for restaurants, um, you know, like I said, the resource piece to me is the most significant. So understanding how much time and how many resources do you have to put into it. So um, this is maybe perhaps less about the algorithm specifically, but more about the development of social. Of course, TikTok has blown up since the pandemic. And I think a lot of restaurants are, you know, concerned if I'm not on, should I be on TikTok? Do I have the bandwidth to be on TikTok? And I think the answer that I'll always give to people is you really should find a few platforms or even just one platform that you can really commit to. Because what it comes down to is consistently showing up in the same way that when your diner is seated at the table, you want to constantly be monitoring whether their water glass is full or whether they could order another cocktail. Um, making sure that you're sort of constantly showing up for these platforms, that will, um, you know, signal to the algorithm and also to your followers that um, you're there. Um, and, and that I think is the most beneficial thing you can do. Great, that's very useful. Thank you. Yes. Hi, panelists. I have a question. Andy, you mentioned um, that experiential spending is what's going to carry restaurants through, and that's something that um, is really persevering right now. I wonder, this trend report has so much great e-commerce data, especially because Back the Box works online um, mostly. I wonder, Crystal, how does that, um, how do you think this will translate in 2024 in the in-room dining experience, and how restaurants might bring a lot of this creativity into the actual experience of the restaurant. Yeah, I mean, I think it's really, I, I go back to that idea of increasing kind of the lifetime value of um, a diner. And I, I was talking to um, one of our members of the hospitality council, and she was saying that um, they do these trips to Spain, you know, as part of their offering. And she knows that if she, someone, if a diner goes on their, this like curated trip to Spain that they do, um, that they are just a lifer at their restaurant. Anytime they're in town, anytime they have an event, anytime they, there's, uh, they need to, you know, celebrate something, they think of her restaurant first because they had that experience. So I think it's a lot about, I think the dining room experience just starts becoming an extension of those people who had those experiences outside of the dining room. So I don't think it, it's, it's not about one replaces the other, it's really just like, and everything's an extension of, you know, the dining room or the, you know, uh, online experience or the, ex, you know, event-based experience. Um, but again, I, I think that helping restaurants really connect like how are they going to know who that person is that walked in you know went on that trip and walked in the door if they're not telling you like how are they actually going to know that um and again so connecting the dots i think is just so important can i follow up crystal because one thing that we're hearing anecdotally we did not survey for that but mm -hmm. a lot of restaurants are developing or you know doing more merch all these kind of things as alternative <coughs> sources of revenue mm -hmm. which is one of the um, lasting effects of the pandemic not putting all your eggs in the dining in basket mm -hmm. right uh, are you seeing that in your data as well is, is that one of the impulses behind this growth yeah absolutely the, um, the merchandise offerings and growth is is really notable and one thing that I've heard, and, and I think that we all kind of just as people in the world know, is that the the margins on the like merchandise are just like, when I hear what they're, they're like 70, 80%, you know, margins compared to what it is in the restaurant. So I think for a restaurant, a little bit of effort to like, um, I, I won't, I'll, I'll, just to give an example of like, packaging up the pasta they make in their restaurant and selling it in a retail space that is extremely lucrative for them and so it, it just really helps um i think it really helps them be able to like not have to be so tight in the dining room experience it kind of gives space because you have these other channels where like the the profitability is so much higher mm. but yeah other questions if all of this is true, it feels a little bit like the idea of a restaurant as being just a place to dine, you serve food, you food, drink in the moment in that space. That feels like a completely unsustainable idea. And so it feels like 
is the challenge to really create restaurants that are multifaceted. Like, it, it's the only way. Like, say goodbye to the room with the food. Say hello <laughs> to the brand. Um, and how do we, I mean, a question for you, Siri, a question for all of us, like, then how do we sort of um, influence, teach, help, shape, and support people who want to be in this business? Um, you know, are we, is this being taught in schools? Is this information that's really being disseminated? This idea that like, you cannot just find that space, serve the food and, and you know, feel, feel fortunate that you're in this industry. So just kind of a, I'm sorry, it's not a, a one specific question. It feels a bit rhetorical, but it did get me think like, how do you even do this now going forward based on these trends? Mm -hmm. If anybody wants to speak to that. Well, I hope it's not that the in-room, the dining experience is out the door. I think that it's more just, as a restaurant, if you're on a very growth trajectory, then it's, it's not about just more covers and more production. And we know the quality goes down when that happens. It's much more about how do you like expand that brand um, and that following outside of, you know, yeah, the four walls. But I would, I would hate to think that expanding a restaurant's brand means that the dining room isn't enough. Like, I think that that, I w that would be bad in my mind, you know? You were gonna, I think you were gonna. I agree, I mean, for me, it's st the restaurant starts in the dining room yeah. and then all of these things stem from it. You yeah. still need the space, you still need the, um, even if people don't come here, I mean, and that's that's pre-pandemic already, right? Like this extension of chefs as brand, people as brand, all of this, and so this continues that. But uh, this is not the end of the restaurant as such. I mean, extend the brand, build the brand. Yeah. <laughs> Robert, did you want to add something? Well, I think we're in the people business, and as long as we remember we're in the people business, we're connecting there, and so we don't limit ourselves to thinking. We're in a box with food. Yes, that's great. And that was a reason that we that brought us out of our homes and brought us together. Um, we're we're evolving as a people, and so therefore how we touch each other, how we serve each other, all of that. I guess I don't look at it as a either or. I always look at it as an opportunity. So we're learning more opportunities and ways to be creative in how we interact. And Robert does that with chocolate very well for anyone interested. <laughs> I think the only Sarah, other thing I would... Oh, go ahead, go I ahead, Just to Crystal. wrap this up. Um, but in terms of like education, I mean, to bring up uh, another organization, we've done a lot of work with Food Education Fund, and there's a lot, and I think you guys have yeah, too, yeah. and they have, um, we've participated in a lot of work in terms of educating the, and Food Education Fund helps um, diverse uh, students, high school students in, in uh, New York um, pave like careers in culinary. Um, and we've done a lot of like sessions where we're teaching these kids, you know, about marketing and social media and e-commerce and how to like round out their culinary education with, the, you know, this type of stuff, so. Mm -hmm. So uh, the past few years has seen a, a loosening in terms of the legislative requirements around tipping. And I'm wondering if in either of your reports you found any information around uh, restaurants moving away from tipping or um, just sent general sentiment around tipping in general. Yeah, um, I can talk about tipping all day. I think it's, a, it's, it's one of the most, it's one of the most interesting and, and defining challenges uh, in the industry right now because it is something that touches both the brutal economics of the industry and also the new concern and the growing concern, the rightfully so growing concern for employee welfare, not subjecting people to bad customers and all that. So um, it is a broadly... I'd say nearly universally disliked thing, but I think one thing that's interesting, especially post-pandemic, is that as of now, restaurants and advocates for restaurant culture need to contend with the fact that it seems like it is here to stay for the at least near term. Um, there have been efforts pre-pandemic to do away with tipping, and they nearly all failed. And there are a lot of people who feel that there is a way to do it. There are, there are some restaurants that are, that ha are moving forward without tipping. 
but it takes a lot of thought. You have to structure in ways that I can't personally speak to, but you have to structure the business to um, account for that higher uh, cost of labor. And um, into the breach is stepping a lot of legislation like the one fair wage that we've seen in Chicago and California, which is modifying, but even that doesn't even, even those new efforts don't aim to do away with tipping. So again, tipping is this thing where it, it touches, it, there's a lot of surface area in terms of the cultural issues of it, um, but the economics, they just insist that, that the, the, the institution stay. And I think it'll be an interesting challenge in the next few years to see how restaurants take up the challenge of replacing it with something more equitable. And then in our answers, we saw some uh, people who are really con expressing concern about the, um, the tip credit disappearing, especially because that raises their wage um, uh, bulk so, so much when that's not the case. And then uh, as of January 1st, minimum wage is going up in a number of places. So that also came up in the, uh, in the answers as to challenges for t of 2024, a big concern around that. Um, and it's not that they don't want to do it, but it's just, it's, it gets to a point where it's unsustainable um, and there's not enough legis legislative uh, willpower there. W one thing there's legislate, the FTC has just introduced a, um, uh, possible legislation f uh, against junk fees that delivery service, credit card services, etc., are charging over and over again. However, that might affect restaurants because uh, it also targets all of the additional fees that restaurants are charging on checks, including service fees. So, um, my hope, if there is movement there, that would be catastrophic. However, there can't be really any change there if there's not change on tipping, right? So if suddenly it's not possible to do service fees anymore, um, is that actually what, will it, what it will take to get tipping legislation to change because it just won't be an option anymore and people can't just be um, uh, not doing it basically because the, then it'd be impossible to pay anybody in the industry. Just a follow-up, if you don't mind, is did you see anything around including back of house employees in the temple? Our survey was for diners. So, um, no, I mean, we can, I can say that there's uh, one of our like marquee customers that um, is called Birdies in Austin. They are one of these restaurants that have, that pride themselves on complete tip pooling so that everybody's getting tipped out the same way, which practice, which is currently not legal in the city. Um, I think it's an interesting, it, yeah. It, I think it requires more experimentation, and these restaurants are laboratories. Um, and there's the, a lot of restaurateurs' hearts are in the right places. That's what I can say from having talked to a number of them. The economics are brutal. The realities can sometimes be constraining, but a lot of them are really genuinely looking for the best way to take care of their stuff. Mm. Yes, yeah, same. It came up in a couple of answers, but mostly it's something we hear all the time, right? I think that's probably the number one thing that most chef owners want to do or most owners want to do is pay back of their house more. And changes around tipping legislation or tip credit actually don't really allow for that. So reducing that disparity between back and front of the house is a, is a really big goal. We didn't track it with data this time, but uh, anecdotally we know that it's, it's prevalent. When you're talking about the, the raise in, in prices from a restaurant's point of view, like raising the menu prices, have you noticed that there's a, also a, a backlash, if you will, of the, 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 the check average? Because it's like the price is going up, people are tend to sharing as opposed to like going to that higher price and ultimately it's hurting your bottom line in some ways. I actually wonder if Andy, you can speak, yeah. We don't have any data necessarily on that, but anecdotally, some, especially some, some larger restaurants who do interviews have said that in 22, not so much, everyone was hit from inflation and diners understood that costs were just spiraling out of control, but that one of the reasons that price increases have pulled back in 23 is that folks who were more aggressive saw declines. Uh, Noodles & Co. is a big chain that specifically share data around this where they were too aggressive in raising prices, saw big traffic declines, and then walked it back. Uh, second question, in New York in particular, we have had the cabins uh, on the street helping, helping us quite a bit in raising our, our um, 
income. And so I'm just wondering if you've considered the fact that we are going to be losing those in November of 24 and how that's going to affect the coming year. We did not track that specifically. No, us neither. But I'm making a note of that. <laughs> yeah. Well, and also all the costs that were invested in building those infrastructures. And um, I know actually one of our well alums is working uh, with her community board in Harlem to try and have it be done on more of a case by case basis because it feels like the the good actors are being punished for the bad actors, right? And for the, the cabins and these kind of infrastructures that are shoddy, that are not maintained, that are not in use, when the great majority of them are actually in great shape and customers have been really enjoying them. So um, there's there's some movement in, in, on the advocacy side around this, but uh, no data. So is it with the community boards that those conversations would need to be had or the How? New York City Hospitality Alliance right, um, yeah. is also working on things like that. I've seen a lot of things through their emails around legislation and mobilization. Uh, and then in this particular case, it was one chef who told us she was doing that in Harlem, talking to her community board. But happy to find out more uh, if that's useful. Thank you all so, so much for being here, really. Thank you so much to our partners at Bento.